What's up guys, it's Dalmater here, and today we're going to be reacting to another Italian Spartacus video. This one is the Imperial Guard Elysian Drop Troops. So we've reacted to, I think, three of these so far, and we're going to work our way through the entire series. He has a series on basically all of the different uh, guard troops uh, with, you know, within the Imperial Guard. And yeah, it seems kind of interesting. I don't know too much about Elysia. Um... I'm assuming that they're, you know, some kind of orbital drop troops, uh, you know, your standard thing in sci-fi, but uh, kind of like your ODSTs in Halo. But uh, yeah, let's jump into it. Link to the original video down below, and this is again Imperial Guard Elysian drop troops from Italian Spartacus. The Imperial Guardsmen are typically seen as an infantry force, deploying around the Imperium to defend its frontiers, its integral planets, and reinforcing some of the more elite arms of the Imperial military, such as the Space Marines. Some regiments are relegated to a more defensive role, like we saw with Cadians, or clandestine, well, quote-unquote clandestine infiltrators like the Catachans. But there is another regiment of the Imperial Guardsmen, one that is absolutely pants shitting insane, one that has dropped into the most hellish engagements well behind enemy lines, one that the Death Corps of Krieg keep up in their barracks walls like pinups because they admire their balls of solid steel. The Elysian drop troops are essentially Warhammer's equivalent of Halo's orbital drop shock troopers, or. Okay, so yeah, they're, they're ODSTs. ODST for short. They even have a similar aesthetic. Hailing from the planet of Elysia, the drop troops are known across the Imperium for their deployment into battlefields much in the same methodology of elite paratroopers of our own timeline's military history. With their first mention in White Dwarf number 248 in 2000, they were but a footnote in the Imperial Guard forces deployed to Armageddon during the release of the corresponding supplement. It wasn't until the second version of the 3rd edition Imperial Guard Codex in 2003 that the Elysian drop troopers get a nod in a codex. They didn't get much of a fleshing out until the 5th edition's codex some years later, and then a larger role in the Regiments of Distinction Elysian drop troops digital book that came out during the 6th edition. Since then, they have become one of the better known regiments in the tabletop, with plenty of artistic representation across the Imperial Armor and Gathering Storm books. Forge World gave them a set of models through most of 6th, but they were discontinued in April of 2018, unfortunately. So in our video today, we're going to explore those origins of the Elysian drop troops, as well as their organization, combat doctrine, so on and so forth. So let's dive on in. Which I realize is actually a really bad pun, but as always, we're going to start with the planet itself. And Elysia is a very interesting planet. Uh, partly because it's not some blasted landscape whose home is hive cities and hazardous waste. Nay, Elysia fits its name. It's a beautiful, verdant world of rich greens, blue oceans, and clear skies. Also, it's classified as a civilized world, which differs from a hive world in that it hasn't reached the population capacity to really progress to the need for massive hive cities throughout the planet. Civilized worlds look much like our planet of current day, sprawling urban cities and wide open expanses of land in between. Since civilized worlds don't have a... So that's basically, if, if you wanted to live somewhere in the Warhammer 40k universe, basically you'd want to live on a civilized world. Because hive worlds seem like shit, and then I guess some of the medieval worlds would probably be pretty cool. Um, depending on, you know, the rules they have there. Because right? obviously it could get, you know, pretty medieval, but uh, <laughs> yeah seems like, you know, between, like, living in fucking jungles with, like, crazy parasites or living on, like, you know, desert wasteland planets or in a hive city where there's, like, 20 billion people in your fucking city. It seems like, you know, somewhere realistic, like, more, uh, I shouldn't say realistic, more uh, comparative to, like, modern day Earth would probably be the best. A highly specialized output such as, say, a forge or industrial world civilized world's imperial tithe typically extends mainly to their ability to produce imperial guard regiments. This is of course the same on Elysia. The planet itself is but a mere 30 light years from the hive world of Armageddon, skirting the border between the Sigmentum Solar and the Sigmentum Ultima. What makes Elysia such a standout planet is that it's housed within the system bearing its name. The Elysia system is on a major warp trade route that many ships pass through en route in and out of the Segmentums. 
This makes the system, filled with gas clouds, asteroid fields, and what have you, a great location for both human and Eldari pirates to ply their trade. This brings us nicely into discussing the drop troops, as they are some of the best ship-to-ship -ship fighters in not just the Imperial Guard, but the Imperium as a whole. Each member of the drop troops must spend a mandatory year or so in the Elysian Planetary Defense Force. And as an extension of the planet or PDF's duties, they don't just protect the planet, but the system as a whole. And with that comes fighting off the aforementioned pirates that use the system's natural cover to ambush trade ships. So, from day one, Elysians are raised in a crucible of fire, fighting through intense ship-to-ship -ship engagements, cut off from support, and surrounded by the enemy, a trend that will start to repeat itself as we discuss the regiment as a whole. Now, there's no conscription that occurs on Elysia. Uh, fighting in the drop troops is considered an honor, uh, because who wouldn't want to fight in an, in an elite galactic paratrooper force? Elysians that sign up are deployed around the planet to various training facilities. The fact that the planet isn't trying to kill them or isn't irradiated means that the drop troops have a ton of bases that dot the planet, allowing them to receive extensive training in grav shoots before their first deployments. This is probably worth bringing up right now, but the drop troops don't use parachutes like we would otherwise. What do you see when you see you? So it, it seems like with these guys, they're very like, Obviously, their home world is very much like Earth, right? Or like modern day Earth, I guess. Terra in the 40k universe isn't very, you know, it's it's kind of fucked. Right? It's it's actually less like Earth than modern Earth is. Um, the and, and and like their culture when it comes to war is kind. Of, I guess you could kind of say like similar to America. It's all volunteer fighters, but there's like a lot of uh, I don't like. Not nobility is not the right word. A lot of he just said it. I'm having a brain fire. Um, there's a lot of prestige that comes with it, so a lot of people just willingly join. So, and the good thing about that is you get a lot of the time you get the best of the best, right? Because the people that want to sign up are going to want to do it. Whereas with conscripts, this is a big issue they had in both world wars. Conscripts don't want to fight, so they don't really train as hard. Which I mean, it's not really good for them because they're going to get themselves fucking shot. But. Um, it's, yeah, like, a lot of the time, like, volunteer fighting forces are much better than conscripted fighting forces. ...normally think of when we, you know, think of paratroopers. Drop troops use the aforementioned grav shoot. These need some explanation because they are insane. Uh, it's not that you can just drop from a low-flying vehicle. Nope. The grav shoot enables a drop trooper to deploy all the way up in the planet's thermosphere. To give you a frame of reference of how high up that is, you're looking at 60 miles, or 90 kilometers, above the surface of a planet. And that's just the start of the thermosphere. You know, the place where aliens and satellites hang out. These guys put the halo jump to shame. The chute comes equipped with two small thrusters that helped to decrease the speed- I think he means halo jump as in like halo, the actual like military procedure, not the games, because the- the Halo in the games, they obviously they shoot them right from the ship, so it's as high if not higher. ...speed of the descent before impact, as well as adjusting their landing. With an onboard solar battery, shoots will last a solid hour or so before recharging by simply being on the trooper's back, after landing of course. Much like Space Marines, these shoots enable the Elysian drop troops to deploy into any engagement on any planet. Well, uh, within reason of course. Adding to this, the Elysians are also trained extensively in both marksmanship and explosives. With such a heavy emphasis on ship-to-ship -ship combat, the PDF employ explosives to blow open bulkheads, breach ships' armor plating, and destroy integral systems. So they seek As mentioned earlier, these guys are clearly dropping deep into enemy lines. And yeah, it seems like they're kind of like a mix between like a recon, an ODST, and like a CKB or CQB. CQB, yeah. As thus are cut off from any conventional supply lines. This is where the marksmanship comes into play. Being trained to make every shot count ensures that the supplies they are dropped with last as long as possible for any Imperial elements to connect with the deep striking Elysians. Now that we have a good idea of the history and training of the regiment, the real big question is, how does this play into their ability to fight the enemy as well as organization? seeing as how they are a regiment focused on rapid deployment. When we look at the typical structure of an Imperial Guard regiment, even the Catachans, it's a very standard military construct. 
you have a company command followed by multiple platoons filled with squads. Uh, respective sergeants and special weapon platforms also fill into those squads and what have you. In addition, you also have different classifications of companies, such as armored, recon, artillery, so on and so forth. The biggest strength of the Imperial Guard is their diversity of armament and ability to adapt to the field of battle. The Elysian drop troops cannot afford that luxury, unfortunately. But that is not to say that they are gimped as far as military forces go. The Elysians do not rely on the heavy weapons platforms and various Lehman Rust patterns of the other regiments. Instead, they lean heavily on Sentinels, the Warhammer. So, so with like a lot of these. Do they make their own technology, a lot of these different Imperial Guard regiments, or is it all just done by the Mechanicus? Because it seems like a lot of them have like specific technologies that are for them. For ATST, uh, Taurus Rapid Assault Vehicles, and a number of other lighter vehicles that can be dropped alongside the troops descending on the enemy target. In addition, the Elysians employ a higher number of Valkyrie Assault and Vulture gunships to aid in both rapid deployment and air support during their engagements. Whereas other regiments, such as the Steel Legion we talked about, would have a higher amount of armored vehicles or Chimera. This all adds very well to the combat doctrine the Elysians follow. Deployed mainly to protracted sieges or campaigns with high-value targets, the Elysian drop troops make up some of the most elite units of any Guardsman regiment we've talked about thus far. Like I said, all the other regiments rely on, or at least they can rely on, heavy vehicles to support them or provide artillery fire. The Elysians are relegated mainly to their LAS guns and explosives, dropping from orbit or outside of a Valkyrie to assault a target. Once captured, they hold the line until forces can help relieve them. Because of this, the Elysians fight in engagements with rather uh, poor outcomes, for the drop troops at least. Uh, surrounded and cut off, their only support comes from attack runs by vultures, targeting enemy vehicles as ammunition permits them allow or at least allows them to do. Other than that, it's las guns and explosives against the enemy forces, with a number of other little heavier weapons here and there, which we'll talk about in a bit. And due to the slow, grinding nature of other regiments, Elysians typically find themselves killed to a man, defending their objective. It's a grim reality of the mobile shock troops that the drop troopers are. They are one of the only regiments in the Imperium with such a high amount of successful deployments. Well, successful in that they achieve their mission, not that they make it out alive. The only other regiment that comes to mind is the Harakoni Warhawks, and that's as far as a regiment of like really high renown. There are a couple other um, Imperial Guard drop regiments is what they're called, but these are the only two that I can think of that have such a, a big pedigree, I guess you could say. But even during deployments where the drop troopers are not dropped into the back lines, they'll harry the outskirts of the enemy's position, employing guerrilla and hit and run tactics. The Elysians will interrupt supply lines, harass patrols, and attack isolated pockets of infantry before disappearing on their Valkyries. With the regiment's high death tally on most of their uh, engagements, the survivors are some of the most hardened and experienced guardsmen in the Imperium has to offer. Even after one engagement, an Elysian drop trooper will go through a more grizzled and loss-heavy campaign than most regiments will experience on an entire career. The result is a regiment with a much higher than average number of stormtroopers. Mr. Clean Magic Eraser. So why do they, like, I'm guessing a lot of this has to do with, like, the, the glory of the Empire and, like, wanting to die for the Emperor. Because it seems like if you had, you know, one of these, like, volunteer fighting forces, it would be much more difficult to convince them to be volunteers with, like, a high, high death count than, say... I mean, I guess in Warhammer they all have really high death counts, but, like, it seems like these guys, like, from the way he's talking at least... Their death count is much higher than even a lot of the other regiments. So, you know, using your volunteer soldiers there it seems kind of weird, right? You feel like you'd want to use conscripts. Um, but maybe, maybe it's, like, because they're so zealous that they're better for this. I don't know. I guess, yeah, like, I guess the big issue with conscripts, too, is if they know they're going to get, like, fed to the fucking, you know, fed to the machine just, like, <clears throat> butchered up, it might be difficult to convince them to do that. I mean, they already don't want to be there. Elite troops of the Imperial Guard. 
And we've talked about these guys with some of the other regiments, such as the famous Katie and Kasserkin. The Elysians have entire companies comprised of these a shithouse insane paratrooper badasses. The stormtroopers will spearhead an assault, with the drop troopers falling in moments after to either relieve or reinforce their veteran brothers. To give you, I guess, a kind of a frame of reference from pop culture, if you've seen the movie Black Hawk Down, you have US Army Rangers with elements of Delta Force in them. So an already elite fighting force of paratroopers reinforced by a higher tier of elite soldiers fighting alongside them. Now, due to their specific brand of war, the drop troopers also have a different loadout than their fellow guardsmen. Remember, these are paratroopers, so their gear has to facilitate that. Each guardsman is equipped with a higher than normal amount of carapace armor, somewhere below the typical stormtrooper, but far above your average soldier. This is partly because of Elysia itself being such a rich and prosperous planet that they can afford it, but also due to the necessity of increased defense in such isolated engagements. So I have a question. In like the modern era of Warhammer, so like the 42nd millennium or whatever they're in, how normal is it for people to just move from planet to planet? Because it's like I imagine it, it might vary from planet to planet too, right? Because you obviously have like medieval worlds and shit there, uh, where they view like space marines as like these, you know, almost deities representing the other deity that is the emperor. Um, so they're probably not leaving very much because I mean they don't even have fucking tractors, right? They got like horses plowing their fields. But if you go if you go to like a more advanced planet that's actually got like the ability to like jump between you know, use the warp or whatever. How, how, how often is it for somebody to like, yeah, I'm going to move to this other planet. Is that like a thing that happens? Or do they even talk about that? Is there anything that really talks about like civilian life in this or is it all just military? Forge World books really go into some great detail about how the drop troopers are fitted out. Each one is equipped with an Akatran pattern Mark IV LAS gun. This features a bullpup design to the gun. Think uh, Stair Og, but in the future. A bullpup basically means that the... Um, magazine and the action you know, where you reload the magazine is behind the trigger reducing the weight and the size of the gun this aids the trooper with a smaller profile weapon unlike a normal as gun it only comes in semi-automatic as well again giving that nod to making every shot count in fact almost all of their weaponry is that same bullpup design which you'll see in the the picture it's going to pop up in just a little bit Loaded to the brim with auxiliary grenade launchers, LAS cutters, ground scanner, or scanners, LAS pistols, assault shotguns, and other forms of modified weaponry, the troopers effectively deploy a variety of firepower across the regiment. Uh, missile launchers, heavy bolters, and mortars being some of the favorite heavy weapons because of their compact design. There are even modified versions of their LAS gun to fit the role of sniping. Essentially, the entire regiment is heavily modular able to adapt to the conditions that each squad is fitted for. So rather than deploying sniper squads, heavy weapons platforms, so on and so forth, as other regiments do, the Elysians adapt each squad's needs to the mission at hand. Now, I really enjoy this approach because it's a very interesting way that we see a special forces style fighting force in the Warhammer universe without them having you know, bullet deflecting abs or gas masks that look like skulls. It is a very similar, or it's very similar to, say, you know, the British SAS or the U.S. Navy SEAL, which are highly adaptable op operators. Which is actually a great time to bring up the uniform and overall appearance of the troopers and its possible influences. Because when we look at the Elysian drop troops, we see a very distinctive look. Carapace chest piece that sweeps over the shoulders, then armored elbow and knee pads. Essentially, these guys are ready to take on the most intense rollerblading the galaxy has ever seen. And this is referred to as the PT-38 jumpsuit and makes up the standard uniform of the troopers. The quilted and padded look adds impact protection due to, the, due to the variety of heights that these bad boys can come hurling to earth from. Each trooper is outfitted with a special helmet that is, again, modular. It's pressurized to prevent the inner ear from rupturing during rapid descent as air pressure fluctuates through each couple of hundred feet that this insane badass plummets from. If they are doing a higher altitude jump, a rebreather is added to the helmet that seals the armor, allowing for those top end atmospheric deployments. Now, when we look at this armor in uniform, we can see a lot of parallels to our modern day fighting forces. The heavy body armor around the chest, head and elbows and knee pads is the same style that we get much of the armed forces across the world. Bringing up that previous parallel. Yeah, this one looks very much more like a 
I wouldn't say like modern modern, right? There's obviously like these kind of like spalders look almost like, you know, fucking shoulder pads from like medieval knight armor, um, but it does look more like 1970s, 1980s era military than you know some of the like what was the one that we watched the Death Corps of Kree we watched uh, yesterday, where it was very very clearly heavily inspired by mostly World War One, and also there was like kind of little hints of World War Two. We see a lot of British SAS and US Navy SEAL influence in the overall aesthetic of these guys. Uh, they don't really have flippers or boonie hats, but you get the idea. Now, bridging the gap on a joke I made earlier, we also see a uniform that is very similar to the orbital drop shock troops of the Halo universe. Uh, Master Chief is a Spartan super soldier, but the ODST were just normal soldiers with elite levels of training. So not only does that aesthetic mirror the Elysian drop troops, but the overall use of them does as well. So if, uh, if you haven't touched that game, give the opening portion a look on YouTube. Um, it's very kind of similar to how I would imagine you get the Elysian drop troops uh, deploying. Yeah, ODST is a fucking awesome game. It's, it's technically, it's, it's kind of its own game, kind of an expansion for Halo 3. It's a weird game. Um, they, they released it like it came out on its own disc, but then like the, it came with a bonus multiplayer disc. It was literally just Halo 3 multiplayer with all the DLC maps. Um, but I, I wouldn't say the armor, like at least not the, the ones he's showing here, the armor in that does not look very similar at all. I mean, like there, there are some similar aspects, right? But it's much more, this is like very 70s, 80s looking. Um, it, it, this is like kind of retro futuristic, right? Like it's like clearly they got like jetpacks and shit. Um, but this looks very much like 70s armor. The... The, the armor that you see the ODSTs wear in Halo looks much more like a futuristic version of, I would say, like, modern armor than armor from, like, a half century ago. Um, so, I mean, there, there's definitely some similarities, right? They have, like, the knee pads and stuff, and, like, to some degree, like, this kind of, like, shoulder armor and chest piece and shit. But, like, it, it, it's much more of, like, a full body suit. I'll see if I can find a picture of it. Um... Halo 3 ODST armor. Yeah, so like this is what an ODST looks like. So it's it's yeah, very different, clearly. Like they have the the, the helmet's completely different, like it's much more modern looking. But anyway. Now I wouldn't be surprised if portions of Warhammer 40,000 influenced the creation of ODST or the Spartan Super Soldier, but then again, an elite combat force utilizing Halo-style jumps isn't necessarily an original IP. I mean, no, it's, not, it's literally something that happens in real life. It's happened since at least World War II, probably before that, so it's kind of hard to call it an, uh, like intellectual property when it's something that's existed in real life since at least a half century before this game even came out. Um, but, I mean, undeniably, Halo was influenced by Warhammer, right? You can see that in, like, the 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 different races within the game, um, which were, like, clearly heavily influenced by StarCraft and uh, Warhammer. And then, like, StarCraft itself was very heavily influenced by Warhammer. So it's undeniably influenced by Warhammer, but I think the concept of an ODST, that's just... That's common in sci-fi, because it's common in... It's basically just the next step of, like, a Halo dropper, right? Like which is a real thing that's existed for fucking half a century plus, almost a century at this point. So we get a style of soldier that is a bit closer to home compared to the 19th and 20th century uniforms that influenced the previous regiments we've discussed. Before we jump into the conclusion of our video though, it's still 20th I briefly century, want to hit on the century. spinward front. This is a major engagement across the Solixis sector that was a huge part of the Asher Militarum narrative prior to a lot of the goings on of this current 42nd millennium. During the Spinward Front, the Elysians were deployed across all the many war zones with target rich environments. Uh, there were so many vital objectives across all the many planets of uh, Calf, Sickle, Thrax, Horizon, so on and so forth, that the Elysians were only deployed when absolutely necessary. That isn't to say that they weren't used in great number, but more to, a, to point out at how specialized their missions were. They repelled Dark Eldar on the planet of Kalf by adding to the momentum of a grand counteroffensive. They helped to will down and sabotage the orc forces on the planet of Sickle. One of their last engagements during the Spinward Front was on Thrax, where nine red... What so, do, do they ever fight chaos, or is that just... 
specifically reserved for the Space Marines because I I've heard them mention in like different things that the uh, that like the Inquisition or whatever it's called will kill different people that have seen chaos because they don't want them spreading it amongst people that like chaos actually exists because they don't want people worshiping it even though there's already chaos cultists. Jumans were lost and stranded on a world controlled partly by orcs and partly by the Severan Dominate, a small pocket of worlds in the Selixis sector that seceded from the Empire. And I wanted to give you guys some sort of real world application of these glorious drop troopers who hurl towards the earth screaming caca for the Emperor because Aww. I feel like I've just kind of really only talked about their history and stuff like that. This kind of gives you an idea of, of where they've actually been used in the Imperium. Typically though, I like to go into where the regiment is in the current timeline of the 42nd millennium. With the Sasatrix Maledictum raging through the Imperium, it's a pretty tumultuous time for any and all Imperial Guard regiments. Unfortunately, we don't have much record of what the Elysian drop troops are getting into right now. That isn't to say that they're destroyed, but rather that they're missing from the grander narrative right now. As of the publishing of this video, the only evidence I could find was of their participation in attempting to repel the 13th Black Crusade. Okay. 16th, or so they've definitely fought demons before then. 41st, 101st, 156th, and 158th Inquisition Elysian got drop troop regiments were all deployed in opposition of Abaddon's grand assault on the Imperium. The 16th, 101st, and 158th all being present on Cadia, attacking deep into the heart of Abaddon's forces to secure objectives. Even with their experience for holding hard points, the Elysians were not successful as the grand stalemate of Cadia raged on. We all know that Cadia stands though, so I won't say anything to the contrary. But in the growing narrative of the Psychic Awakening and conflicts popping up all over the Imperium, we will hopefully begin to see the Elysians joining the stage once more. Extensive experience fighting against various Orc Waz, including the Third War of Armageddon, multiple deployments against Tyranids and High Fleet Kraken, uh, fighting Abaddon's Vanguard and the Traitorous Legions, battling ceaselessly with Eldar Pirates and Craft Worlds, there is no enemy that the Elysian Drop Troops cannot employ their special brand of fighting against. I want to thank you guys for joining me in this video here today. It was a bit shorter of one than our normal regiment videos, but there isn't as much history for these guys. There's actually... It's funny he says this because this is literally the longest out of the... I think this is the fourth regiment video I've watched. It's literally the longest out of the four I've watched. He says it's shorter than most of them. I mean, I guess I still have like eight left, so maybe the, the rest are longer, but... Far more information about their loadouts, armory, and organization than there is stories, which is unfortunate, but also pretty cool. Usually it's so far that the uh, to the opposite that it leaves you wondering what the other regiments use for anything. Uh, the Forge World books get very detailed, like I was saying earlier. I mean, telling you the special mole patterns that each and every variation of the weapons that they use, it's it's super detailed. I try to just truncate it as best as I, as best as I could. But next up is the Valhallen Ice Warriors, which I'm saving for kind of a mid-December video. I figure they're the closest regiment we have to a Christmas-themed one, so it feels like it's the right time to do it. But we still have the Talon Desert Raiders, Tannis First and Only, and some other regiments. I'm thinking of doing uh, a video here where I hit on some of the regiments without as much lore, but are still really liked, just to kind of give them some spotlight and put the other ones together that are smaller in their narrative, but at least people want to hear about. I think the the Praetorians, I think, are one of them that is a little bit smaller. The, the Harakani Warhawks, again, are a little bit smaller as far as the amount of information in them, but a lot of people really like them and want to hear about them. But let me know if that sounds like a good idea to you guys. I'm always in... So yeah, very interesting. Obviously, um, I would I would say one, the one big thing I kind of didn't agree with him here was where he was talking about like how they're very much more futuristic looking. They're very clearly inspired by I would say like 1970s and 80s cold like end of the Cold War era, like U.S. and to some degree even Soviet troops, right? With like the kind of armor they have, but then obviously like with the, like a retro futuristic spin as it, as you see on a lot of these, like the Death Corps of Kree were obviously like World War One era retro futurism. Um, and yeah, I didn't really find it that accurate to compare them to the ODST armor look because again, the ODSTs look so much more advanced, but they do seem to be one of the, you know, more interesting factions within this and how they just kind of don't talk about them that much. They just kind of talk about like their, uh, their armaments and their equipment and stuff. But anyway, let me know what you think. Like, comment, subscribe. See you in the next one.